Good morning. Can can you hear me okay? Um, I guess I have to use the microphone because we're um, live streaming. But uh, my name is Ronnie Bell. I'm an enrolled member of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. I am a, a professor in the at the Wake Forest School of Medicine and also chair the North Carolina American Indian Health Board. Um, very honored to be able to speak to you today and uh, to be invited to do this presentation by uh, the conference planning committee and to, to tag team uh, with Vicki Bradley, who's going to share with you some of the great work that's going on um, in the Eastern Bay and Cherokee community. Uh, so we're going to be talking today about understanding and addressing uh, opioid and substance abuse among uh, the American Indian populations in, in North Carolina. Uh, next slide. So this is an outline of our presentation. It's going to talk about um, who are the American Indian people in North Carolina, uh, talk about uh, overdose in American Indians in North Carolina, uh, talk about how that has led to some of the issues we've seen, has led to collaborations in this area, uh, talk specifically about this uh, syringe services program in North Carolina, and then I'm going to turn it over to, to Vicki to talk about um, their program uh, that they're doing uh, on the Koala Boundary. Next slide. So, um, so our first part of the presentation, uh, next slide. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, North Carolina has uh, eight uh, state and federally recognized tribes. Um, uh, only one of those eight tribes is federally recognized, the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And so you can see that our, our tribal populations are spread out uh, across the state, mostly in rural communities, but we also have four urban Indian centers in our four largest cities in uh, Charlotte, uh, Greensboro, Raleigh, and Fayetteville. Next slide. And uh, interestingly, we've seen quite a significant uh, increase in the number of people who identify as American Indian or Alaska Native in North Carolina um, uh, from the 2010 census to the 2020 census. And a large contribution of that is the number of people who uh, identify as American Indian plus some other race, uh, racial group. Next slide. And in fact, uh, what we saw is a 72, 73% um, increase in the number of people who identified either as American Indian, Alaska Native, um, or some other race. And so you can see how that has uh, is dis distributed across the, the counties in 100 counties in North Carolina. Next slide. Uh, and we see, as many of the tribes across the country, uh, we see uh, significant uh, disparities as it relates to the social determinants of health. Um, our state Center for Health Statistics has over the last 20 to 30 years has been doing a really nice job uh, of collecting and disseminating data on American Indian health issues in our state. So um, we are now able to, uh, unlike when I first started in this work where the state would only give us data on um, white and non-white or white, black and other, um, now there we are able to get data um, to help us uh, focus uh, our efforts on areas uh, specific to American Indian disparity. So uh, when we look at some of these issues like poverty, um, lack, uh, limited formal in, uh, in, uh, education, uh, access to insurance, uh, disability status, uh, all or most of those uh, show a significant disparity for American Indians in our state. Next slide. And then some of the um, um, uh, uh, health indicators such as uh, smoking, obesity, um, the percentage of people who self-rate their health as fair or poor, and um, amazingly, the number of people who report two or more chronic health conditions, almost half of our American Indian adults in North Carolina 
um, indicate that they have at least uh, two chronic health conditions, which uh, presents with a number of uh, health challenges for our population. Next slide. And then just to show you uh, some of the specific disparities in, in um, um, uh, health outcomes, uh, so we see, you know, high rates of heart disease, diabetes, uh, cancer, uh, motor vehicular accidents, and homicides. Next slide. So um, as it relates specifically to uh, overdose and its impact on our tribal communities in North Carolina, um, I I've been working with um, uh, the Injury and Violence Prevention Branch at our state health department. They actually uh, reached out to me about five years ago and said, hey, you know, we're seeing some really interesting data uh, that we'd like to share with you and share with your health board. Um, and and we're, we're pretty concerned about what we're seeing is that, you know, we're seeing a trend of some adverse health outcomes as it, as it relates to, uh, to overdose among the American Indian population in the state. So um, they started putting together some of this data. And so I uh, want to share with you some of that data. So if you'll go to the next slide. Um, so, so we know that um, there, there's been a, you know, this, this significant issue with um, uh, deaths and emergency room visits related to, to overdose and specifically um, uh, we've seen in, in the last few years the, the impact uh, of the opioid epidemic, and, and that has, uh, has continued on into the COVID pandemic, uh, where we, we continue to see uh, this high trajectory of um, uh, deaths related to, to substance abuse in our, in our country. Next slide. And um, as, as you can see here, what, what we've seen is a um, nationally, a, a 39% increase uh, in the number of people who died from a drug over, overdose from 2019 uh, uh, to 2021. And so we can continue to, to monitor that given where we are uh, and continue to be with the pandemic. Next slide. Um, and so as we've seen nationally, we see have seen a similar increase, uh, almost exactly the same as what we've seen nationally. If you look at the data from, from 2019 uh, to 2020, um, there has been a 40% a, a increase uh, in the number of people who died uh, from, from, a, from an overdose uh, among our, our citizens in North Carolina. Next slide. And so, um, we, if you look uh, into 2021, uh, that uh, that of the data that we have available to us that was analyzed in 2021, um, not not as high of a of an impact, uh, but still seeing a, an increase uh, in the number of people who um, died or uh, had an uh, visit to the emergency department for uh, uh, substance or relate, substance use related issue. Next slide. Um, and, and what we are able to do in North Carolina, uh, looking at our um, uh, death certificate data and looking at our uh, ED uh, data, we're able to look specifically what, what is driving um, these, these deaths and, and ED visits, what, what types of, of substances are driving that. And as you can see from, uh, from the data here, uh, beginning around uh, 2015, there's just a sharp, sharp increase in the number of uh, cases, uh, number of deaths specific to, to the use of fentanyl. And so uh, obviously, a, and, and even a slight increase in the number of deaths related to cocaine. So certainly something that's uh, very, very concerning. Next slide. Um, and so, you know, it, unfortunately it, it's been sort of the, the case that we have seen the opioid epidemic, um, the, the use of, of, of many, uh, illicit substances as being an issue uh, that pr primarily <clears throat> affects uh, the non-Hispanic white population. And so uh, these are, um, you know, some, some uh, national press releases that sort of seem to indicate um, 
that this is a, a white problem. And so, um, and the response to a problem that affects the white population is different than what we see, um, how we see. So for example, the, the crack ep epidemic in the, the 80s and 90s, the, the response to that is a lot different than the response that we've seen to the opioid epidemic uh, over the last uh, 10 or 12 years. Next slide. And so as, we, as it relates specifically to the American Indian population in North Carolina, and, and this is something I'm sure that all of you have to deal with because uh, the number of people that uh, identify as American and Alaska Native relative to the, to the non-Hispanic white population is relatively small. <clears throat> if we look at the absolute numbers of people um, who are impacted by, in this case, uh, overdose deaths, but any health condition, it, it, it our numbers look small. And so if we just look at the numbers of people uh, in North Carolina who, who died from an overdose from, from 2000 to 2020, and just looking at the non-Hispanic uh, um, non uh, American Indian population, the numbers look relatively small. However, if you go to the next slide and look at it as, a, as it relates to the uh, proportion of the uh, population uh, in those particular uh, racial and ethnic categories, then you can see a, a huge difference in, in how we should interpret that data. So for example, here, looking at in 2020, uh, the overdose death rate for non-Hispanic whites was 36.1 per 100,000. So again, we're taking into consideration uh, the rate of that um, um, of that condition based on the size of the population. Whereas for the, <clears throat> the non-Hispanic American Indian population, um, that rate is, I think it's 83.6. So, so a much greater uh, uh, rate of the, of the issue uh, versus just looking at the absolute numbers. Next slide. <clears throat> so, um, so this is looking at, uh, looking at over that 20, 21 year period, looking at overdose death rates uh, per 100,000 population and looking at the five major racial and ethnic populations in the state of North Carolina. And you can see that, again, keeping in mind, you know, that we sort of, again, sort of go to thinking about the opioid epidemic being a, um, a, pr a problem in the white population. What we, what we see in North Carolina is that uh, as a rate of the of the total population in these groups, uh, the American Indian population has the highest overall overdose death rate at 20.1 per 100,000 population. Next slide. And what's interesting too is if you look at, if you break it down by uh, the demographics of the population who are specifically impacted. So it, uh, just to orient you here, so the, the numbers on the right and the dark blue is the total North Carolina population. The numbers on the left are the uh, American Indian population. What you'll notice, at least what first came out to me when I first saw this was that the, again, our perception oftentimes is that these are issues that, that affect white people, but also affect men. And what we see in North Carolina is that the female population um, is is much greatly much more greatly affected by this issue um, than what we see statewide. So, uh, twelve point five per hundred thousand females, American Indian females, die from overdose deaths uh, compared to, to eight point zero for the the total U.S. population. Uh, and the other thing that we see too is that in the the young the adolescent population, the the fifteen to twenty four adolescent and young adults. Uh, a higher rate of death, 11.7 .7 per 100,000, uh, compared to um, the total state population of 8.5 per 100,000. Next slide. And then, so we think about some, some of the consequences of um, the, the, the use of illicit substances and thinking about uh, the transmission of, of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. Um, so the, the state has also been able to uh, to look at some of that data and show specifically how uh, for the uh, American Indian uh, population, uh, what we see is that um, much higher rates of hepatitis C for the American Indian Alaska Native population in the state um, 
as well as rates of hepatitis B, which are fairly similar to what we see in the non-Hispanic white population, but definitely a significant impact as it relates to hepatitis C. Next slide. And so our state has been, I thought, I think they've done a really good job of trying to respond to some of these issues. They um, have put together a um, uh, opioid and substance abuse uh, action plan that's been available uh, for the last, I think that came out in 2018. And so they, they have a really nice uh, model that they put together with equity at the center of that model. And so um, we, we have been trying to um, add the voice of Native people into the work that the state has been doing uh, within the action plan. And so this is available online. If you just Google uh, North Carolina Opioid and Substance Abuse Action Plan, you should be able to find it. Next slide. And so um, you know, they're continuing this effort as it relates to, uh, again, what we're seeing uh, in, in North Carolina um, and specifically since what we've seen in, uh, since the pandemic. So trying to increase awareness uh, of the, the impact of um, uh, opioid and substance abuse and how it's impacting our, our communities and, and how it's been um, uh, much more, the, the impact has been greater uh, since the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. Uh, and then this is just you know showing how um, some of these uh, data break down as it relates to um, the, the equity issues and how uh, specifically these uh, these numbers have increased over the last three years. Next slide. And uh, the state too has also been doing a really nice job of trying to uh, uh, find various venues to disseminate this information, not just. Um, on their website, but also um, at uh, uh, state and national public health uh, conferences. This, uh, this is a poster on the left that was presented at the uh, American Public Health Association meeting um, in 20, uh, I think it was 2019. And then um, there was a, I was very fortunate to be the guest editor of a special issue of the North Carolina Medical Journal back in November of 2021. And it, the, the whole uh, issue was focused on health issues for American Indians in North Carolina. And uh, one of the articles that was written in that issue uh, was about uh, this issue about opioid and substance abuse and how it's effect, uh, affecting our tribal communities. Next slide. And I wanna just give a huge shout out to uh, Mary Beth Cox and Scott Provishel who are um, at the Injury and Violence Prevention Branch with our, our state uh, Department of, of Public Health. They've just done a phenomenal job of uh, bringing this issue to, uh, to the attention of the, the state leadership, uh, as well as to uh, policymakers. So, um, and they're the ones that, that handled the data and uh, have, have been very uh, engaging with me and, and with other tribal leaders on these issues. Next slide. So uh, just talk briefly about how some of this data has been used to, to move efforts forward. Um, next slide. So as I mentioned, I, I chair the, the North Carolina American Indian Health Board. Um, we have a, a three-pronged effort focused on uh, research, education, and advocacy for our tribal communities in the state. I uh, wanted to give a shout out to Charlene Hunt, who's our program manager and uh, very active in the community. And uh, going out to different events to uh, to raise awareness on these various issues. Next slide. And so one of the things that we did, we did a series of uh, educational infographics and uh, on different health issues that affect uh, our our American Indian communities in North Carolina. <clears throat> and one of those that we did uh, was to focus specifically on opioids and, and substance abuse. Um, those uh, fact sheets are available on the the uh, if you Google the if you go to the North Carolina Office of Minority Health and Health Disparities or to the North Carolina American Indian Health Board website, you can you can find those infographics. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> we also um, have two really nice uh, reports that are available to us: uh, tribal community health reports. One is the the Eastern Band Cherokees their tribal health assessment that was done back in 2018. 
and also uh, a, a, a report that was done called the Native Pathways to Health, where uh, tribes across the state uh, participated in talking circles and talked about some of the issues that uh, are health issues that are impacting their communities. Um, that was published in well, it was published in November of 2020, but the data was collected uh, prior to that, so prior to to the pandemic. It's actually, so both of those reports were were prior to um, prior to the pandemic. Uh, next slide. And also, we we were able to uh, get data or get some funding from the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists uh, to hold a uh, a summit in in Raleigh uh, on June 24th of 2019. Uh, and so we invited uh, tribal leaders across the state to to come to Raleigh for a day um, to talk about to share with them some of the data that. Um, that the state was seeing and, and what we might do to uh, address these issues. And we uh, put together an action plan. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see, this was not too long uh, before, um, before COVID hit. So we hadn't really been able to implement a, a lot of those uh, action items that were put into place. Uh, but I think you know now that we're seeing that we're continuing to have these issues and the issues are, are escalating at a, at a high rate, um, that it's hopefully we'll be able to, to re-engage uh, with the tribal leaders on these issues. Next slide. Um, so I want to talk specifically about the syringe services program that we have in North Carolina. Uh, next slide. So uh, in 2016, the state um, legalized the syringe services program. Um, they uh, The language specifically states that uh, any governmental or non-governmental organization that promotes scientifically proven ways of mitigating health risk associated with drug use uh, and other high-risk behaviors can start an SSP. And so um, this was, you know, great news for our state. Um, North Carolina is kind of a, a purple state, if you will. So we're, uh, we're not red, we're not blue, but um, I, I think this was really uh, a, a great win, a great public health win for our state to have this program um, legalize. Next. And so this is an overuse. So it was legalized in uh, July of 2016. Um, it, is, um, it is broad and permissive, and it provides latitude for uh, diverse types of programs. Um, it is, uh, uh, gives opportunities to uh, be able to provide uh, best practices for, for what communities feel like will work best for them. And also um, having the opportunity to, um, to best engage with community leaders about these issues is, is something that uh, lends itself to the success of a program like this. Next slide. So this shows you uh, in 2020 and 2021, uh, it shows you the number of counties that are directly served uh, by a syringe services programs and um, also additional counties in the, in the um, uh, counties that have sort of the jagged line. So you can see that um, the, the majority of our state uh, is covered by directly or indirectly covered by these programs. And you can see uh, the types of programs or, that are supported uh, over to the left there, community-based organizations, faith-based programs, local health departments, uh, health systems, um, and the list goes on and on there. So next slide. And so this is just a, a list of the uh, uh, breakdown of the number of people who are served by these uh, certain safe syringe uh, initiatives. And so you can see that uh, in 2020 and 2021, um, there were about over 80,000 people um, who were uh, served and uh, there, or there, there were uh, 82,000 total contacts uh, and 26,500 unique individuals who were served, uh, which was an increase of 73% from the previous year. Next slide. And uh, th this is just uh, reporting on uh, to the left there, the, uh, the distribution of 8 million uh, syringes uh, in 2020 and 2021. And uh, to the right, um, almost uh, 90,000 naloxone kits were distributed. And, it, so, and again, you can see how 
the availability of these resources increased dramatically from 2019-2020 to 2020-2021. To so again, uh, a great success, public health success in the dissemination of these uh, important materials. Next slide. So now I'm going to turn it over to, to Vicki to talk about uh, their program on, on the Koala Boundary with the, with the Eastern Band. I'm Vicki Bradley. I'm the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians. And I see a number of familiar faces in the room. We're honored that you decided to join our group today because it's competitive, isn't it? We all wanted to be in the other um, sessions. They're, they are really quality presentations. So thank you, Dr. Bell for your for your information about North Carolina. What I'm going to do at this point is to pivot and talk about one of our tribes in the USA area, which is the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, where I'm a citizen, and what we have done locally to combat HCV and opioid overdose. Next slide. But what I want to do first is ground us in what is harm reduction because that's what I'm gonna talk about. And that's what I think syringe services programs are grounded in is harm reduction principles. Now the slides that you see are those that we've developed locally for our own program and the foundational principles on which we are based. So what we believe after doing mentorships and training with other programs um, across the country back in 2014, 15, I'll give you some history. Our HCV rates went up and I'll show you that data in just a minute, but we needed to do something because people were dying from hepatitis and people were starting to die from overdose. And so we looked at what worked, what was best practice across the world. And we knew that the World Health Organization showed that syringe service programs or harm reduction programs were effective. And so we immediately reached out to CDC. They recommended the greater Louisville area and the Louisville Metro Exchange. And so we went and, and done some mentorships in time there. So harm reduction accepts for better or for worse that illegal and legal drugs are part of our society. But this program chooses to minimize the harmful effects of those drugs. We accept that quality of life definitions for individuals and community are diverse, but they do not always embrace complete abstinence. So this is a paradigm shift, isn't it? In native communities, I've been in this work since 1988 and worked uh, in substance abuse in a lot of different areas. And ultimately uh, the last nine, 10 years in public health, we have seen everything from total abstinence to a lot of different types of recovery uh, modalities and frameworks. Harm reduction is a bit different. It was pretty difficult for me as I'm a registered nurse by background um, to say it's maybe we're not gonna push abstinence in this program. We're going to accept people exactly where they are. Let them define what success looks like. And it's not always cessation. Not always. We recognize that the social determinants of health, we've heard a lot about that this morning, adverse childhood experiences, social inequities affect how people deal with drug-related harm. We know that a lot of things about people who use drugs tell us that they're self-medicating. They're doing a lot of things and a lot of reasons they're using or started to use. We give the people who use drugs population a voice in programs and in policy. So historically, as public health or health professionals, it's easy to say, oh, we're gonna write this policy and then we're going to lay it up on you and this is the way we're gonna run our program. In a truly effective harm reduction program, the people tell us what they need and then we develop policy around that. It does not dismiss abstinence programs at all. We do not dismiss medication assisted therapy. We do not dismiss any other viable option for recovery. In fact, the reason we chose syringe service program is because people that are a participant in a syringe service program are five 
times more likely to enter into treatment, five times, pretty amazing. And it does not encourage high-risk behaviors, okay? Next slide, please. So what does it look like? This is a graphic that I created for our community based on EBCI program. It may look different if you develop this in your community, but what we wanted at the center and core function of this program is equitable, equitable access. We wanted anyone that felt like they needed services for a syringe exchange, education, transition to some type of health program could access this program. Now this is iterative. It can go either direction and this happens all the time. So place-based care. We feel like we care for our own better than any people in the state. Now we were very gracious that in 2016, North Carolina passed a syringe service law that allowed syringe service programs because it paved the way for our community. But could we develop a program without our own tribal law? No, we have fully codified public health laws. And so we had to introduce legislation to our tribal council to allow syringe service programs. And in addition to that, we had to do a piece of legislation for limited immunity for our public safety team so that they understood if they stopped someone and they had syringes and residual in those syringes and they had a, a membership card to the syringe service program, they would not be charged with criminal activity, okay? This program is, uh, provides education in a lot of areas, advocacy, linkages, and testing. That's what we want. When people come into our program, it's not just, okay, here's some clean syringes and move on. It's about, let's get you connected with a primary care provider. Let's get you connected to housing. Let's get you connected to health services, uh, to prenatal care, to whatever that person needs. Really important. Individual counseling and support. We don't provide individual counseling at the program. We do have a behavioral health therapist often co-located in our program so that if someone is ready at that moment to say, I'm done, and the way we transcribe that to them is whenever you're ready, we don't say if you, but we say whenever you're ready to stop doing what you're doing and you want something different in your life, we're ready to fast track you into, into treatment. And then the biggest one, and this probably should be a ring around the whole thing is acceptance and love. We, we don't judge, we don't pry, we don't assume, we just give unconditional love. Okay, next slide. So what is it and why was it right for us? We do distribute sterile syringes and safe use supplies. So what does that look like? We give tourniquets, we give cookers, we give cotton balls, we give water, we give food, we give whatever we need to do so that the person can inject safely. Prior to COVID, we made them responsible. We had this display of everything they need and they were required once we give the syringes to go get what they need to inject safely. Post COVID and during COVID to minimize contact, we developed bags and asked them what they needed. So we engage hard to reach populations and keep them engaged with the health system. This program has drastically increased the number of people that are connected and impaneled to a primary care provider in our community. Whereas before they were afraid to go to the health system. So that's been a paradigm shift. We support individ individuals to protect their health while using as they consider treatment and recovery. It really is amazing. And I'll throw in a couple of anecdotes just to keep your interest, hopefully. Um, people come into our program. This is the most disenfranchised, marginalized population in our community. They're embarrassed. They're ashamed. They've lost everything. And they're hopeless. And so when they come in and we say, we're so glad you're here today. We're so glad you're allowing us to help and assist you they look at you like you're crazy. They really are amazed. 
And so I, I had a gentleman come in and he, um, he scared people in the community just because of the way he looked. He had a lot of piercings and he had full body tattoos, face, head, neck. And he came in with his head down and I told him, I'm so glad you're here today. And he just kind of looked at me and he said, I'm scared. Only he said, I'm scared. And I'm thinking, you're scared? He said, I said, what are you afraid of? He said, I don't know. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just afraid to be here. I said, how did you get here? He said, a friend told me about you. He told me that, that, I would, that you would be kind to me. And so we done the intake, went through the exchange. And as he was leaving, he stopped and he turned around and he said he was right. He said, no one has showed me kindness in many, many years. It was nice to have somebody kind to me today. That's the kind of thing that bring people into care. That's the kind of thing that connect them and help them feel like they are capable of doing something different. I say people don't wake up today thinking, oh, I think I'm going to go get a needle and stick it in my arm. They're just not. There are a lot of things that transition people into care. So we provide linkages. We encourage and offer texting. We reduce fatal overdoses. Dr. Bell talked about overdoses in North Carolina. In 2016, in one month, June of 2016, we had 16 people die in our community. Now, we're a small Western North Carolina community. There's 16,000 people, and we're right at the great base of the Great Smoky Mountains, and everyone knows everyone. And as you know, in your community, when there's a death, it affects the whole community. So imagine 16 in one month. So we distribute naloxone. North Carolina has been very generous. The injury prevention program, they just, they, our first 5,000 doses they gave to us. So we now have a CDC cooperative grant that funds a number of things and initiatives in this program. So these harm reduction programs prove to reduce HIV and HCV rates by about 50%. And we have clean syringe litter in the community and that's a whole different conversation I'll talk about in a little bit. And this improves population health, which is my passion. Next slide. What we knew about the issue prior to 2018, we went live in 2018. We knew that our HCV rates increased exponentially and I'll show you some data in just a minute. 6% of our user population was diagnosed with HCV or hepatitis C. Heroin deaths in North Carolina rose 565% between 2010 and 2014. Our overdose rates increased exponentially and 13.2% of all of our EBCI deaths between 2002 and 2014 were related to opioids. Now that has increased tremendously. And we had people complaining about their syringes all over our community. Next. So let me just jump to the point here. Uh, I could give you year over year data, but I didn't wanna take all that time I can talk about this all day, but we're, we've been open for four years now. So let me talk about each one of these categories for a minute. What do our participants look like? Our participants range from 16 to 80 years old. The average age is 33 years old. Okay. Our participants are businessmen. They are people that you would never, ever think would inject drugs. And they are homeless, some. I mean, so it's from all gamuts of society. You can't stereotype who uses injectable drugs. When we went to the greater Louisville area, their average max injections per day was eight. Now we've looked at this data kind of longitudinally for a while and our average max injections per day averages, our participants average 14 a day. 
Why is that? We're not sure. What we suspect, based on what we hear from our public safety partners, is that the drugs coming into our community from the cartel are nasty. They're not pure, they're mixed with a lot of things and it takes a lot more to keep the high going. Do you have a question, sir? So of all the participants, we have 641 unique participants. And then we look at uh, our visits are 14,000. So if we average that out, our participants on average inject 14 times a day. Yes. And that's a lot. For someone who injects drugs, what they tell us, what our participants tell us is that they have to inject every two to three hours to not get dope sick. Okay. So we do an intake assessment on admission, and then we do an exchange. The exchange takes about two minutes, literally but they have to answer the same questions. Those questions look like, when was the last time you used? Why do we ask that? Because if they used greater than 24 hours ago, we remind them your chance of overdose if you have used greater than 24 hours ago increases by 50%. So mix your shot, don't mix it hot, start out slow. We, that's harm reduction. That's reminding them of things. There was a question. We didn't, no. This is just our data and we actually developed our own software package through a company called Bariton Software that we are really looking in depth at a lot of things. We collect a lot of data in this program and we're very upfront with participants. It is an anonymous program. We give a code for when they come in, we don't take names and we give a card with that number. And it looks something like the first letter of your mother's maiden name, your year of birth, and there's a couple other things. And they have a card that we laminate and they keep with them that they're a participant, yeah. And so uh, they do, a, they do a, a screen. When was the last time you use? What's your drug of choice? Have you been reversed with naloxone since your last exchange? They can come as often as they want. We're open five business days a week and they can come every day if they want. Actually, we're open four days. Wednesday, we don't do exchanges and I'll tell you why in just a minute. Okay, so we learned that there are questions that are really difficult to ask. Asking someone, do you share syringes? Is like, who do you have sex with last night? Just taboo. Injecting drugs is very, very personal. It's a very intimate experience. What we find is even those who are in recovery that were people who injected drugs for many years will still inject saline because it's the ritual that they enjoy. 7%. Uh, when we first started, that was really, really high. I don't remember the exact number, but it was upwards of 40%. Age started using drugs or alcohol, 19. This question is at what age did you start using on a regular basis, okay? Total participant visits, over 14,000. We have dispensed over 600,000 syringes. And our syringe return rate, and this is one we're proud of, is 538,000. It's 86%. I think North Carolina is around 40 some percent. Um, why do we have such a high return rate? Relationship. Relationship and rigid policies about the program. So if you don't bring syringes, you don't get syringes and you have to bring them every time. And then we calculate how many syringes you need, how many days are you before you return, how many times are you injecting, and that's the amount of syringes we give. Is this program expensive? Yes. CDC does not pay with our grant for syringes. That is tribally funded. And I have to say hats off to EBCI Tribal Council 
because uh, it is tribal monies that fund the equipment for this program. We have a staff of four and we have an annual operating budget of about $900,000. I know that's important when you're thinking about um, doing this. It doesn't have to be this scale. It can be very small in a very small space. Next slide. So this is kind of hard to read. The story behind the curve here is that look at our total visits, which is in the top, and then new participants. So we open, we started collecting data June of 2019 so when we really started collecting data. The program we visited said that in the first year, you may get 40 participants. Mm -mm. This was our full first year and you can see how many participants we had. So in tribal communities, if you develop rapport relationship with your participants, they will trust you because you will establish relationship. I can't emphasize that enough. And when they found out that they're not gonna get arrested when they come to our program, we're not gonna horse whip them into going to treatment, we are simply there to help assist them to stay healthy. Uh, was that a hard sell? Yes, the hardest sell was to our public safety team. Our police department was really angry with our division. So what did we do? We got a certified harm reduction specialist to come in and to spend a full day with the police department. And at the end of that day, we had buy-in. Prior to starting this program, we went to every community and talked about what we wanted to do, it took a year or so of tribal leadership to get buy-in. Um, so it, it was work, but it was worth it. So what you see in March of 20, you see a dip here. Our tribal community went to a total stay-at-home shutdown for six weeks, and this program was closed for a short time in March and April, about two weeks. And what we realized was we can't close this program. We have to open this program. And so we totally started doing exchanges outside on the porch, changed the way we did things and got it operational. So we saw a dip. But then in July of 21, we took an exponential increase. And this is when we, um, the tribe was, things began to open back up from the pandemic and people started moving around again. But the story is we averaged somewhere between 300 and 400 visits a month. Next slide. So we kept hearing about syringe litter in the community and we were like, what can we do? All right, let's think out of the box. And so we put 26 of these syringe kiosks across our uh, the Koala Boundary and our Snowbird and Cherokee County communities, which are 60 miles from our outlying community. Um, we had seen this in larger metropolitan areas and we thought, why not? It will help not only our syringe participants, but it will help people who are having diabetic syringes and no place to dispose of them. And so they're locked. We put the decals on them ourselves. This project was funded by our CDC cooperative for opiate reduction. And our team got really creative and it's like, we're not gonna handle those syringes and count them. So how do we do that? So they took syringes, used syringes with really safe equipment and they weighed and, what, and they weighed it numerous times and what they come out with there's about 133 syringes per pound. And so we can stratify based on the number of pounds, how many syringes we collect. So we started closing on Wednesdays because it took a full day for our teams to go empty these kiosks and collect them. And then we have um, a, a truck, we have a company that, that picks these up for us but there are cardboard boxes in there. And uh, so we now have scales and we have those all over the community. This does not negate the fact that our participants say, oh, I put mine in the syringe kiosk. Nope, 
as a participant, you can do that, but you also have to bring syringes back to our program. Any questions about this? It changed the landscape of the community. I can tell you, we rarely see syringes uh, in around river. We put them in strange places too. We put one in every community, but we also found out where people were gathering to use along the riverbanks and we put kiosks there as well. Gabby? Yeah, people do that. Uh, and you can you can't see this, but it says dedicated to the protection of a clean and safe and healthy community. So we did not want there to be stigma around these kiosks. And when we marketed this initiative, that's the way we promoted it. Anyone can use them. You can put your diabetic syringes, you can put, and so we made it okay. When you dispose your syringes of your syringes correctly, you're protecting our community and you will not be judged for doing that. And so the courthouse has court every week. There's over a hundred people go there and we try to make it as convenient as possible. And one of the marketing points was to put them in public spaces so that it does send a clear message that our community is in support of a safe community. Uh, that's, yes, yes. Yeah. Next slide. Our team empties those. There are boxes that come that go in there. They're like, a, um, they're really thick cardboard that can't be pierced that fit into these kiosks. And then we actually give needle dispensing containers at our syringe. It's one of the pieces of equipment that we give to people. They can have small ones that fit into backpacks. They can carry gallon jugs. Um, and then they just bring those in and we never open those lids. They tell us, that's part of their responsibility, how many syringes are in your container this week? And we trust them. And they may say there's 200, there's 30, you know, there's 20 from yesterday or whatever. And then that's how we base the formula on, on the exchange. We also have a contract with a company, um, biohazard company that picks up, yes. because we do a calculation on how many clean needles they get. And so it's part of the responsibility. It keeps them in touch with how often they're injecting and how many clean needles that they need. And so it helps us with data and it helps us to see how many times people are injecting, the types of drugs they're injecting, just things like that. So it's more of a personal responsibility. And, um, in that what we learned when we mentored at other programs or we understudied at other programs, if you don't have um, a count of what's coming back in, you can't determine your exchange, your return rate to see really how effective you are at cleaning the community. I'm going to hold that question to the end. Okay. Next question. I mean, next slide. So this is OD map. Uh, we use OD map. How many of you have ever heard of OD map? Okay. I have to read the title because I always get this wrong. This OD map was created by the Washington, Baltimore high intensity drug trafficking area. It's basically a data sharing agreement with communities. It's a free application that communities can use. Our EMS puts all of our suspected overdoses into the map. They record the date, the location, the time. 
Did they dis, did they distribute nalox? Did they administer naloxone? How many doses? And was the reversal fatal or non-fatal? Were they taken to the ED? It's amazing. We could do a whole presentation. And uh, our epidemiologist, Mark Tuttle, is doing some mentoring with some of your tribes to show how to use ODMAP. It's a great tool. It will show uh, the incidences. And so we can tell if there's clusters in the community in what community. I mean, we can drill down now with ArcGIS into even the actual house. We can um, look at the day of the week, the time of the day. It's really helpful for public safety to see what the drug cartel is in our community. So this is September 2017 through June 22. You can see in marginalized populations, the pandemic this first year, people being isolated and at home and not having access to things they need care, we felt like really uh, impaired mental health status. And you can see in June of 2020, this is also our per capita gaming distributions go to members in June and December. And we can always see peaks, unfortunately, because the drug cartels know that now and it's like a retail business and they actually target our community but we had 29 overdoses in june of that year and then 24 in december 33 suspected fatal overdoses this is not 100 percent accurate because those who overdose and go to the ed our physicians don't often code overdose deaths as an overdose we're really working with them on that because they don't want to stigmatize and hurt the family's feelings by saying that. So they might say death from respiratory distress or something like that. So we're working on that. And then we just know the number of naloxone administered on scene. What our participants tell us is that it often takes three doses of naloxone to reverse. And it's because of fentanyl. And, we, and most of our fatalities are fentanyl. Next slide. So for those of you that are nerds about public health data, probably like Dr. Bell and I are, <laughs> this is what we want to see. We want to see a perfect epi curve, right? When you start seeing incidents in a community, you typically see it go up. You want to see it come down. We look at this with COVID. But if we look at 2011, we started seeing our HCV or hepatitis rates go up. 2016 was our peak. We started doing education in the community uh, about HCV. In 2017, we started hitting hard on using clean syringes. We opened our program in 18, and you can see we've had a 50% reduction since we opened our syringe services program. Yay, really excited about that. Next slide. All right, so I wanna go back to your question. Community engagement strategies and lessons learned, and I'll be quick, I know we're out of time, wanna be respectful of that. Grassroots efforts gain support. Our first conversations were with our health board, which is our tribal leaders saying, here's the data. You know, we can talk anecdotes all day long. People have HCV, but this is what it really looks like. This is the number of females, this is the number of males, this is the number of babies, this is the number of older people that have hepatitis C in our community. Why are they getting it? They're getting it because they're using, they're injecting drugs. That's the number one reason people get HCV. How do we stop that? What do we do? There's things we can do, but it's going to be a total paradigm shift from what you're used to because people think we are enabling people to use drugs and we're not. We are just trying to offer a safer way until they make the decision to get into recovery. And so it was actually one of the council members, we didn't take the resolution, it was impromptu. Um, and she, while we were having this discussion, she said, I'm going to introduce a resolution. And she came back in just a few minutes to and directed us to develop a syringe service program. That was in October, she wanted to open by January. So we pedaled fast. <laughs> Um, so I said, tribal leadership, public safety, community buy-ins critical. If your public safety teams aren't on board, 
they will her when we first open our police would troll our syringe service program and we were like stop it just stop that you know just stop and then that's when we had to get training for them marketing public relations campaigns are critical and not this is not just social media we use social media a lot because we want to reach that population but we did face-to-face -face contact in every single community that we could get into, which was all of them. We went to faith-based organizations and we got buy-in there. So anywhere there was, um, we felt like people had relationship. We done listening sessions in the communities. Uh, so we done campaigns. Like I just said, don't exclude your faith-based groups. They are some of our staunchest supporters of this program. Our faith-based organizations, supply us with hygiene kits with crackers and food and pop tarts and things that are non-perishable that our homeless population needs and water so they they are real supporters factual factual data was always used to create buying from community we love anecdotes i can tell you anecdotes that we would all be sitting here crying of things that have happened from this program because there's been such great successes but anecdotes don't prove effectiveness. They don't prove efficacy. You have to get data. And so there was no prior data, like, like you said. So we started immediately. We felt like longitudinally, we really needed to see if this program, if the juice was worth the squeeze. And so we feel like it is. Next. So it's not just about the syringes. This is about lives. And I will share this anecdote because I use her quote, and if I can get through it without crying, just <laughs> please understand. This is my mother. And I have a brother who is a person who uses drugs, and he's 63 years old. And if it wasn't for her, he wouldn't even have a place to live. But when we opened this program, years ago, and I was talking to her, my mother's very, very devout, conservative Christian. She couldn't understand. She said, I just don't understand. Why would you want to give them syringes? Why would you want to help them use? And I said, we're not helping them, mom. We're helping them to stay safe. She said, I don't know. I need to think about that. So she came back a few days later and she said, I get it. I get it. My brother's name is Jack, and she said, as long as Jack, my son, is breathing and he's upright, there is hope. There's hope for him to change. But the minute he stops breathing, it's gone. So she said, if this program will give him hope and keep him going, then maybe one day we'll see something different. And I thought that was very powerful. So. Uh, we're open to helping you. We have mentored a number of uh, tribal programs now in the USAID area that are interested. If you have interest, we'd be glad to host you in our community. You're glad to look at the exchange, uh, answer any questions that you have. I apologize for going over. Um, I'm glad to stay if you have questions. Shiki. Thank you, Dr. Bell and Vicki Bradley for that powerful session. As a token of our appreciation, we would like to present you with these guests. And I am getting to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.